Good afternoon, this is John Cresswell from the University of Nebraska Lincoln. I'm back again to talk about mixed methods research in this video series that I've put together. Today I want to vi visit with you a little bit about basic mixed methods research designs. The first place to start is that there are many different types of mixed methods designs out there and there are many classifications. The thing about doing a design, using a design in mixed methods is to keep it very simple. And what I'm going to focus in on what I call the basic designs. At the heart of every mixed method study is a very simple basic design. And your task as a researcher is to figure out what that design is. And I can help you through this slide set. We also know that designs are emerging, often emerging rather than fixed so that during a project we might change the design and that's certainly fine. Also within each design, basic design, there are certain steps that I'll be going through. I'm going to show you some diagrams of what the design looks like and I'm going to talk also about what we call the validity threads or methodological issues in actually conducting these designs. So the three basic designs are a convergent design and these names are very intentional. Convergent means we're going to be merging two databases. Explanatory sequential meaning we're going to sequentially connect a qualitative and quantitative database and have the second database help explain the first, explanatory. And then exploratory, which is just the reverse of explanatory, we're going to start qualitatively and build something quantitatively through the second database. So we call that an exploratory sequential design. So let's first start with this convergent design. And this is a very simple graphic of how the design sets up. We're going to collect qualitative data and analyze it, and quantitative and analyze it, and then compare the two results. We're going to merge these two databases and then make an interpretation. The whole intent of this design is to capture two different perspectives on a problem. One based on uh, a rating form or a survey or a questionnaire that people might fill out, and the second on individual interviews. And so those personal views are going to be compared with the more uh, statistical, quantitative views. And we're going to bring those two views together. Now this design can be drawn uh, vertically, as in that last slide, or more horizontally in this slide. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of difference. I've seen them drawn both ways. The steps in conducting a convergent design, uh, there are just five of them. First, we're going to collect both quantitative and qualitative data, typically at roughly the same time. We're going to analyze both databases independently, and then we're going to bring the results together. We're going to compare the quantitative and qualitative results. Now, when we compare these two results, we're then going to compare them to see if they, the two pictures of our problem actually converge or where they might diverge. Now if they diverge, we need to explain that divergence. And so I'll go into some of the explanations as to how we might help to explain that divergence if it occurs. I've drawn a kind of a process diagram here, uh, starting with a comparison question and then both forms of data, uh, collecting both forms of data and then merging it, and then comparing the results and then resolving discrepancies or convergence or divergence. So this, is, this follows those steps I've just mentioned. Now I put something else into this diagram and that is that there are certain points that you need to pay attention to if you're using this, this design. But these are potential validity threats. In other words, they might be points at which your results and interpretation may be inaccurate if you don't follow some of these procedures. The first one is I would set up parallel constructs, variables, or questions between the quantitative and qualitative. They need to be, so if I'm asking uh, uh, open-ended questions qualitatively about self-esteem, then I need to measure quantitatively self-esteem. So, so that's what I mean by parallel questions. Looking at the same concept, both quantitative and qualitatively. And the reason for that is if I'm going to merge these two databases, 
I've got to have some common ground for merging the two databases. Uh, the second point here to pay attention to would be the sample size. Uh, typically people gather more quantitative data than they and they have a larger N than the qualitative N, but um, I've seen many convergent designs where people gather both the quantitative and qualitative data uh, using the same sample size. Uh, usually these results are presented separately and one of the biggest challenges in using this design is how do you actually merge two databases? How do you merge stories, for example, with numbers? And so I'm going to talk about three strategies for merging that are part of this design. These three uh, I call the side-by-side -side comparison of the data, two databases, transforming data, and then creating a joint display. So these are three techniques that have emerged when people are, are comparing the quantitative and qualitative data in a convergent design. This is a side-by-side -side comparison. This is a passage right out of an article by Klassen looking at older driver safety. And when you go into the results of this article, you see that they've arrayed the findings, such as the finding on previous motor vehicle convictions. First of all, they talk about the quantitative results on previous motor vehicle convictions. And then they talk about the qualitative results and then they compare the two. So they are actually putting side by side in a result section, typically this is found in a discussion section, of both the quantitative and qualitative results so you can actually see if they converge or diverge. A second is to transform data. Now this is a study where the, the individuals gathered quantitative and qualitative data and analyze both forms of data, but they took the qualitative results and transformed it into numbers. They counted how many themes or you could count how many codes. And so then that quantitative data is merged into the other quantitative database. And uh, so uh, the data are, the qualitative data are transformed into quantitative uh, forms of data. So that's called data transformation. This is a, a newer area to emerge in convergent designs. It's called a joint display. And what you do in this case is come up with a table, such as I'm showing you here, uh, where you're arraying on different topics in your study, the qualitative results, typically themes, and then the quantitative results in the statistical analysis. And then you might have a third, third column comparing those actual results. So what I'm doing here is I am presenting in one table both the quantitative and qualitative data results so that I can compare the two. So that's the third approach. Well, the issue often arises in a convergent design. What if the two databases diverge or they're contradictory? or there, there are very different perspectives that begin to emerge. How does a researcher go about addressing this? Well, here are some of the strategies that have emerged in the literature. First of all, uh, researchers often go back to the original databases and re-examine them. They may have missed some themes. They may have uh, not looked at some of the uh, quantitative results accurately. Another strategy is to go out and gather more data to resolve that discrepancy. That can be expensive. It's maybe not as used as frequently as uh, it perhaps should be. Often people will go back to, to look at those questions to see if they're parallel between the quantitative and qualitative database. Now, strategies that are probably not recommended would be at the bottom of my list here. One is some researchers side with either the quantitative or the qualitative data, and they give it more value. They say uh, perhaps the qualitative really tells the true story, or perhaps the rating scales on this instrument tell us a better story. Often doctoral students will look at the discrepancy and state it as a limitation in their project. It's not a practice I'd recommend for publication, but you do see this in convergent designs. 
When do you choose this type of design? Often people use a convergent design when they're out in the field and they've got to collect both forms of data at roughly the same time, so it's an efficient, efficient design. Uh, the basic idea is that you're trying to merge these two forms of data for, to develop a more complete understanding of your problem. So if you feel that uh, your problem can best be explained by both quantitative and qualitative data, this is a good design. And people use this when they have a good understanding of some of these merging strategies, such as a joint display, ways in which they want to portray the data side by side. How do you actually spot a convergent design in a journal article? Well, you start by looking to see if the authors called it a convergent design at the beginning. But then you look at the intent of the study. Are they actually trying to merge the two databases to have a more complete understanding or a better understanding of their problem? You can then look into the results section or the discussion section and see if they brought the both, both of the databases together and they actually merged the two databases. So those techniques you can e easily spot a convergent design. I would have to say because of the uh, challenge of trying to merge the data, setting up the project properly with parallel questioning, the convergent design is a fairly challenging design to use. And often people come to it first in mixed methods because they think that the only way I can do mixed methods research is actually to merge the two databases. There's an easier way. Here's the second design, explanatory sequential design. And I think this is a design that's probably the most popular among doctoral students, graduate students, across the United States at least. I call this a two-phase design, where they're first collecting quantitative data, such as doing a survey project, and then following up qualitatively to explain those quantitative results in more detail. When you actually talk to people in the second phase, qualitatively, you can understand your survey results a little bit better. So the intent of this design is to use the quantitative data to help explain use the qualitative data to help explain the quantitative results. So the steps are fairly straightforward here. The first phase is to collect quantitative and, and, and then analyze it, and then look closely at those results to determine what needs to be explained further. Are there surprising ex explanations? Are there uh, extreme cases that need to be looked at? Are there significant predictors? Then you go out and collect the qualitative data to help explain some of those quantitative results, you analyze it, and then end this project by talking how, about how the qualitative data helps to explain the quantitative results. Well, the diagram of this look, might look something like this. Uh, in this picture, I have in the, in the, the large boxes the major steps, first quantitative data collection analysis, then qualitative, and then some interpretation. And then I've also listed, given some examples of some procedures at each stage, and then some products that a researcher might put together. Well, here's another diagram, kind of the step-by-step -step process, where you're starting with a question, you're starting with quali uh, quantitative research questions, hypotheses, collecting data, analyzing it, moving on to qualitative. What I did in this diagram was I put in some of the challenges, the validity threats that are likely to arise. So one challenge is once you've got the quantitative data analyzed, you have your statistical results, what results do you follow up on? And thinking through the possibilities of what results need further explanation, that's a challenge. And then also, what participants, qualitative participants, can help you provide more uh, information about those results, help explain those results. So uh, the sample size is another issue in this design. If you're going to follow up qualitatively to explain a quantitative database, you need to choose qualitative participants in phase two that are from the same sample that filled out the instruments in phase one. 
So you have to pay attention to sample size here. And then also at the interpretation phase, interpreting the quantitative results based on your qualitative data is definitely a step that needs to be taken. It's not always taken in these designs. This challenge of deciding what quantitative results to follow up on or to build on in your qualitative phase. Uh, you could look at demographics. You could look at outliers, extreme cases, important significant results, maybe in insignificant results, results that you thought might have been important as you did your quantitative analysis. Uh, you could follow up qualitatively in these four areas. You can also set up a joint display where you can array your quantitative and qualitative data together. For example, in this example, the quantitative results show no significant difference, but the qualitative follow-up in the next column did show that there were some significant points that were being made. This is a study about caregivers. And then the third column over addresses how the qualitative findings help to explain the quantitative results in more detail. So what I've done here is I've arrayed in a single table both quantitative and qualitative results and I've shown specifically how the qualitative helps to explain the quantitative data. When do you choose this type of design? Well you can see if it's in two phases, quantitative followed by qualitative, it takes a long time. So you've got to have the time. It's not as efficient as a convergent design where you gather both forms of data when you're out to the field once. People that use this design are often those that are very quantitative in their orientation because the entire project, the phase one of this design, starts quantitatively. So you're really building on your quantitative perspective that emerges through the first phase. I think people also use this because it's a very elegant, simple design. It makes, simply makes sense that if you collect quantitative data, it's helpful to follow up qualitatively to explain some of those statistical results. And so uh, it's seen as a fairly straightforward, elegant design. How do you spot one of these designs in a journal article? Well, of course, the first point is you see if the authors called it an explanatory sequential design. Assuming that they're familiar with some of these uh, aspects of this design we've talked about. But uh, I would look to see if there's qualitative data that actually is tied to the quantitative results. You know, it helps to explain the quantitative results. Do the authors make that explicit? And typically, the qualitative should follow the quantitative in any discussion. Uh, so uh, look in terms of uh, whether the results are built sequentially from the quantitative to the qualitative over time. Now what I'm going to do is reverse these two phases of the explanatory sequential design. And rather than starting quantitatively, I'm going to start with qualitative data collection. And this actually is a design that I call a three-phase design. I collect qualitative data and analyze it, and then I build something quantitatively, and then I test out this quantitative instrument or intervention or typology, whatever I've built in my second phase, I test it out quantitatively. So you can see now we've moved from a convergent design, which is a single phase, to an explanatory design, which is a two phase, to now an exploratory design which is three phase. So we're building into a more rigorous type of mixed methods project here. Uh, the intent is to use this design when you first need to explore. So the overall intent of an exploratory sequential design is really to explore first to build a better quantitative phase. The steps in this design are as follows. Uh, first, collecting quantita qualitative data, analyzing it, uh, designing then something quantitatively, a quantitative strand based on what is learned from the qualitative results. For example, it could be to develop a new instrument because there's not an existing instrument that exists that is good to study this particular sample that you're looking at. Another might be to modify an existing instrument 
to develop an intervention that might actually work with a group of people. Another reason would be to develop some type of a classification, typology, taxonomy, that then would be tested quantitatively. So there's a number of, of quantitative types of products that could be developed in this second phase. And then, in the final stage, collecting the quantitative data to test out this instrument. I'll use an instrument here for an example, as an example, and then analyze the data, and then to explain how the quantitative results really help to understand not only the qualitative themes at the beginning, but also provide a better instrument, uh, a more useful intervention approach, a more useful typology. So again, I've drawn a picture here of the process of research, starting with a mixed methods question, gathering get data qualitatively, moving to the second phase of developing something. In this picture, I talk about developing a, a good psychometric instrument, and then phase three, where you're actually testing out that instrument and administering it quantitatively. So those are the three phases. Now, in this picture, I've also put some of the validity threats or the challenges of using this design. Uh, one of the key challenges is deciding what qualitative results to use and how to use them. For example, if you've gathered qualitative data and you have qualitative themes for your analysis, how do those themes then relate to developing an instrument? or what qualitative themes do you look at to help develop this quantitative phase. Also, if you are developing an instrument, good scale, psychometric scale construction is an important issue. So now what we have is, to, to use this design, you need to know about qualitative research, quantitative research, measurement, how to develop a good instrument, as well as mixed methods research. So you can see there's a number of skills that are required to really utilize effectively this design. And then towards the end of this design, explaining how the, the quantitative really helps to build a better understanding from the qualitative results. Here's a picture I put together of uh, this type of a design that starts qualitatively. Uh, you analyze, collect and analyze the data come up with results, uh, then develop an instrument, and then test out the instrument. So one of those challenges, how best to move from, a quali from qualitative themes to developing items that would go on to an instrument. Here's a little uh, schema that might help out. First of all, you take quotes and turn them into specific questions or items in your instrument. Then the codes that you use from your qualitative analysis become your variables and the themes, the broader perspective that you're developing from your qualitative analysis becomes the scales in the, in the instrument. So there's a way that you can move from your qualitative data into developing an instrument. And of course, coming up with, with good steps for constructing a psychometrically sound instrument is also a very rigorous process and there are books out there on scale development that help you build some of these steps but you, these might be some typical examples uh, conceptualizing the constructs developing items based on the literature and the experts pilot testing them gathering more extensive information on a larger sample and looking at exploratory factor analysis confirmatory factor analysis and then administering it to a larger sample yet where you check for reliability and validity. So the steps involved in putting together a good psychometric instrument that would have good scores for validity and reliability is a very rigorous, uh, time-consuming process. So when do you choose this type of rigorous design? Uh, first of all, you need at least time for two phases, if not three phases here. Uh, it's very attractive to qualitatively oriented scholars and students because you're starting qualitatively and then you build into the quantitative direction. Uh, it's also helpful in designing instruments that might work 
with a special sample or population where existing instruments are currently not available, coming up with intervention procedures for an experiment where some of those procedures may not be known in advance, or even coming up with typologies. So there, there are some very specific applications of this, and there, there are some great mixed method studies in the literature on uh, the exploratory sequential design that take you through very rigorous procedures, these three phases of procedures. How do you spot this exploratory sequential design of journal article? Well, you first look to see if, if authors are calling it an exploratory design. Next, you might look to see if it starts qualitatively. In other words, does a qualitative phase precede a quantitative phase? And then you look to see in that quantitative phase what's actually being developed. Is an instrument being developed? Are activities being developed for an intervention? Is a new typology being developed? You look for that quantitative uh, component that's being developed and then whether it's tested out. So I've gone through three types of designs, the convergent, the explanatory sequential design, and the exploratory sequential design. And if you look closely at every mixed method study, within their design should be one of these three. And then in some cases, they build onto these basic designs other features, which I call my advanced mixed methods designs. And in the next video, I'll talk about some of these advanced designs. Thank you.